Our satellites work completely differently. So we can see through the clouds and we can see at nighttime. Well, welcome to Founders in 15s. Today I have a great guest, uh, Payam Banazadeh. Uh, he's uh, been an entrepreneur of ours that we've supported over the past few years and got to know him. I'm very fortunate to have you with us here today. And um, I had a couple of objectives by, um, I wanted to accomplish in today's interview. One is your background, kind of understanding um, your motivation, understanding how you get to this place where you decided to build and uh, pioneer the work you're doing at Capella. And then on, on the other hand, I want to understand the condition of entrepreneurship and space. So let's start with your background. Tell us about you. <laughs> Where did you come from? How long have you been in the United States? And what have you been doing? Good to be here, Bobby. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm an immigrant, so I moved to the U.S. Uh, when I was 16. Um, and I went to high school here. I went to undergrad. Um, I got a job at my dream place, NASA. Um, I went to Stanford for graduate school. And then I started Capella. Um, and before coming to US, I was deeply into astronomy. I was fascinated by the sky and the stars and the formation of stars and how planets uh, you know, go around the sun. And, um, and, and it's just the story of how we got here, the galaxy and just everything in between. And, um, and when I got to US, that's all I wanted to do. I wanted to go work at NASA, which I ended up doing. And I never wanted to start a company, and that's a different story we can get into of how I got into starting a company. Uh, but that's my background. Um, fascinated by the science of astronomy, uh, but then really being an engineer at heart, and therefore studied aerospace. Um, and then I got into the business of space, which is where, where I what am What did today. you do at uh, NASA? What was the uh, area of your focus and expertise there? Yeah, so th back when they hired me, this is back in 2012, and uh, there, was a, there was a massive movement of moving to smaller and smaller satellites. Mm -hmm. And you know, NASA traditionally just does massive, big, billion dollar satellites. And so they wanted to get into that business. And I was, my entire undergraduate was focused on small satellites. So they hired me along with a bunch of others um, to essentially move uh, the formation of a small satellite sort of program within NASA. Um, and so I got into NASA and I had, uh, I proposed a few missions. One of them was to send a small satellite uh, to the moon uh, to look at the dark side of the moon and see if we can find and, um, and map really um, um, ice deposits that are in the permanently shadowed craters. And, and that's really the foundation of moving humans to the moon later because you need, you need water and there's a lot of water on the moon and so you need to map it. And so we, we formulated and proposed a small satellite um, to go to the moon and map it. And that's actually flying pretty soon in the next, wow. in the next couple of years. You know, from 2012 to 2023, when it's going to fly, you know, 10, 11 years. Um, and that's how NASA works, you know. Of course. Takes a long time, you know, and that's what I was doing for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, um, take us all the way uh, to the point where you decided that I want to be an entrepreneur and I'm going to go for it. Yeah. What motivated you? What were the conditions? What was going on with you when you decided to do that? So I left my job at NASA. I, I, I decided to come to Stanford and I wanted to change industry completely. I said, I'm done with space. The stuff is moving really slow. It takes 10 years for one satellite to go up. And in your career, maybe you can get three satellites up. So I was kind of done with that. And I wanted to get into software. So I came up to Stanford. And, uh, and as I moved up here, there was a plane that went missing. It was MH370, it was a Malaysian. That's right, I um, remember that. 777, massive plane, 280 passengers, and it just went missing. And, and I remember everyone was talking about it. It was all over the news every day, CNN, Fox, and all the countries were deploying assets, uh, Navy fleets to go find this plane. And the big question for me was, there's a triple seven that just went missing on this one planet we call home and we can't find it. Like what the hell is going on here? Mm -hmm. And as I started pulling the thread, 
what I realize is we're not really doing a good job of monitoring our own planet. And that's crazy. You know, 21st century, a big plane goes missing, we can't find it. Why is it that we couldn't imme immediately take a picture or a video uh, and figure out where this plane went down and what's going on and, and be able to help? And, and again, as I pulled the thread, I realized there's a bunch of satellites going around Earth and trying to image. Uh, the imaging is either not good or just not sufficient. And there's a better way of doing it. I've not been involved with you for several years and watching you, how you've operationalized this business. Let's start from the end. Today, how many satellites we have up in the air? So we have seven satellites yeah. and we're launching more and more. Um, and with the seven satellites, our satellites are really, really special. Right? Tell us about the satellites. Yeah, so, you know, most of the satellites that are going around Earth, they work just like your phone. They've got a camera, you know, these are Earth observation satellites. They've got a camera, just a bigger camera than your iPhone or your Android phone. And they take pictures of Earth. And the camera requires light, right? Just like how if you take your phone into a dark room, you're not gonna get a pretty picture. It's the same up in space. So when they go over San Francisco and it's three in the morning, they don't see anything, there's no light. Um, or when they go over San Francisco and it's foggy, which, by the way, it's mostly foggy. They also only see the fog. They don't see the city. Um, our satellites work completely differently. So we can see through the clouds and we can see at nighttime or daytime, any other, pretty much all the time. It's mm -hmm. a completely reliable observation system. It's called Synthetic Aperture Radar, or SAR, is the mm -hmm. technology that we use. Um, so we have seven of these now, uh, which allows us to monitor anywhere in the world any time of the day or night, through the storm, through the fog, through the sand, through anything. Um, and you can instruct them from the earth. That's right, we tell them where to look, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, when, the, when there's a volcanic eruption, oftentimes we're the first eyes because, you know, there's, there's ashes and no one can really take an image, whereas we can look through the volcano and, you know, exactly say what's happening. Let's just step back for a minute. So what's the long-term vision for Capella? How do you see Capella five, 10 years out? What's the mission? What's your vision? What is the purpose of this business? Well, you know, if you look, we have deployed billions of sensors terrestrially on our planet, right? IoT sensors, cameras, sensors in the car, sensors at home, sensors everywhere, right? And it's just becoming a very normalized uh, you know, way of doing things to be relying on the sensors around us to tell us what we need to do and what we shouldn't do and you know, predict the future and be able to act and decide you know, smarter about it. What we haven't done yet, um, and we're really at the cusp of it, is be able to connect sensors from space to sensors to the ground, right? And so when you think about sensors in space, there's all sorts of them. There's these optical imaging satellites, which have limitations, can't see through clouds, can't see at nighttime. There's our sensors that we've now deployed, seven of them. We can see all the time, we can see through clouds, we can see at night, daytime and all that. There's other sensors that are gonna be deploy deployed and they're getting deployed in hyperspectral sensors and thermal sensors and other type of imaging. And really the, the, the future is gonna be connecting the space sensors, the space layer with the terrestrial sensors as well as any sensors in between. You've got, you're gonna have balloons, you're gonna have drones, you're gonna have airplanes, you're gonna have all sorts of, you're gonna have sensors in the ocean to look at waves and temperature and pressure. And Capella sits at a very, very unique place because our sensors are extremely unique and I believe it's needed for us to be able to connect the terrestrial and the space sensors along with ocean and air and, and all that. And once you have a, essentially a fully integrated sensor set, um, then you're able to monitor changes on our planet and be able to do this in real time. And once you can monitor changes, um, not only you can start understanding what could happen instead of just something that might have already happened and you missed, you can start predicting what you should do to potentially prevent um, you know, either a, a disaster or you know, you're trying to optimize you know, supply chain. Um, essentially getting ahead of the curve. Let's double click on, so I'm clear on the purpose mission. Operationally, how does this, what, what Capella looks like five years from now? How many satellites you gotta get up there? How much imagery you're capturing? Just give us some metrics. We're gonna have 
more and more satellites, we have seven now, 10, 20, 30, 40, whatever that's gonna be, getting us to the, as real time of response as possible. And we wanna ultimately get to a point where it's completely real time, right? So there's no delay between something happening, our collection and the notification, mm -hmm. immediate, real time. Um, we're gonna be integrating other sensors into our own platform. So we are doing Synthetic Aperture Radar, SAR, mm -hmm. and we're gonna bring in optical, we're gonna bring in the terrestrial IoT systems. We're going to bring in vegetation map that's getting mapped by drones. I see. Um, we're going to we're going to bring all sorts of data into our platform, and our SAR is going to be a unique, important aspect. But there's going to be other ones, and we're going to be working with um, essentially all the big corporations. And uh, you know, if you're a, a Chevron of the world, and five years, ten years from now, you don't have a real-time stream of data from space helping you. Uh, make better decisions on, you know, where you should put your next infrastructure or how your infrastructures are doing and how supply chain is doing, how's your competition doing, um, you know, you're going you're gonna to be hurt because everyone else is going to be doing They're it. Doing and that, so yeah. Capella is going to be at the forefront of um, providing this type of real-time Earth observation capability to commercial as well as government. Mm -hmm. how, yeah. how do you describe the culture of Capella? I mean... What is it like to work there? How do people feel working at Capella? How do they describe the culture of Capella? Extremely collaborative, um, very transparent, um, very honest. Um, and you know, whenever there is a problem, everyone jumps to solve the problem because they see the problems as uh, problems of their own that needs to be solved immediately. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's never, uh, you know, there's never, uh, finger pointing of why we're where we're we here. It's more of where, where we are. Let's solve the problem. I'm going to remind you. I remember uh, March of 2000 when the government essentially told us we have to shut down all of our manufacturing efforts because of the pandemic. And I mean, it was impressive to see how you guys came together and continued the work. We didn't have, we had to build satellites we have to launch satellites. Everything was closed. Yeah. You can't do it remotely. You couldn't do yeah. it remotely. Physically, you could have got together. That's right. That was tough. Yeah. That was tough. That was... And I remember, uh, I think it was towards the end of 2020 that you had a launch. That's right. In New Zealand. So people In had New to Zealand. travel. Across. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. We, yeah. we, the satellites went off from New Zealand. That was super impressive. Um, yeah. That's uh, super impressive, the work you guys have done. A um, couple other things. Personally, uh, how are things going with you? How are you it's, changing and evolving? <laughs> it's, uh, it's been a journey, Bobby, right? So yeah. I started the company six years ago. When I look back, and I think all the founders go through this, uh, you have to evolve yourself, your personal self, in order to be successful as a founder because just like how the company is growing so fast, the type of a leader or the founder of the company needs at every one of these stages is different. That's and if right. you don't keep up with it, then the company moves faster than you and you're just not the right person for the job anymore. And, um, and so when I look at Payam of six years ago, it's a completely different Payam, very different Payam. Um, that evolving and changing is, um, can be, can be uh, pleasurable, uh, but it could be also be really hard, right? Because you know, you're, you're, you're looking at your family, you're looking at your friends, mm -hmm. and you're going through something very different than they're going through. You know, you're changing much, much faster than they're changing. And unless you're, you know, surrounded by people that understand that and are gonna be there to support you, it comes really, becomes really, really yeah. difficult. So it's been <laughs> beautiful, but also really challenging. Demanding, yeah. yeah. Oh, there's a clear correlation the capacity of the founders to learn and change is equally equal the capacity of the organization to right. learn and change. Right. And change is necessary to succeed. Yeah. Change is necessary to succeed. It's a personal, it's, it's a very personal job to be a founder, right? Because, yeah. Uh, and one thing I, it took me a bit to realize, um, you as a founder, especially early on in your, in your, in your founding, you are the company. Right? I mean, you walk into the office, this is before COVID, people are looking at you, right? Your actions, how you behave, how you talk to people, how you make decisions is gonna define the culture of the company in those early days. 
So everything is personal. Um, and you have to realize that you are presenting the company. You are the founder of the company. It's, it's, and it gets really difficult after a while, mm -hmm. right? Because you're under microscope, both internally <laughs> and externally. Yeah. Uh, well, it's been a pleasure to know you. Um, I'm going to be around you for a long time, watching you grow and change. I do believe that what you have built is going to bring a great deal of benefit uh, to society. The technologies that you are offering is going to bring a lot more transparency that we all need to progress. <laughs> and again, I'm looking forward to continue our work and spending time together and learning from each other. Thank you again. Thanks, Bobby. This wouldn't be possible without your help.